Support this podcast via our Patreon and get more writerly goodness. Visit patreon.com slash nanocast to join up. Welcome to NaNoWriMo Every Month. My name is J. Daniel Sawyer. I'm the author of some 20 books, 34 short stories, and numerous articles and other things. And I am your guide on this journey to use NaNoWriMo to level up to professional output levels. Welcome to The Questions, Episode 43. Today, J.R. asks... I have several friends and family who would love to help me by serving as my beta readers for my first novel. My dilemma is that they are fans because of friendship and family ties. I'm not sure how they'll provide the sort of critique I need for the technical, military, tactical, science, plot sequence, etc. of the book. Every time I look into the text, I find little details that I miss, so I know that having beta readers ferret these out is important. In a nutshell... How do I find the best team of beta readers with the right skill set to give me the reviews I need? Well, JR, I'm assuming that you've already listened to the previous episodes on beta readers, so I'll try to come up with some fresh stuff here. Um, There are at least two, maybe three, fairly lengthy episodes on finding beta readers and what they can do for you. First of all, your beta readers are not people that you're wanting to review your book. I mean, they can review your book if they want to on Goodreads or Amazon or what have you, but that's not their job. And um, when you're looking for beta readers, the last thing you want to be doing is looking for someone who will give you a positive review on Amazon. What you want in a beta reader is someone who cares more about the story than they care about you. You don't want someone who's going to encourage you just because you wrote a book. That's what your friends are for. You don't want someone who's going to give you a pass on details because they know that you know them. You want someone who will treat the story like it came from anybody and tell you what kind of crap they found. Now, you want them to stay narrow within their remit. The last thing you want is a beta reader for whom your book is not the kind of story they like to read telling you that it was a piece of shit because it had guns and goblins in it, and they hate stories with guns and goblins. I was in the position once where I baited a book that was really over-the-top cartoony action, and I really hate that kind of action, and I didn't realize going in that that's the kind of book it was, and so I marked all over the manuscript about the problems they had with physics and whatnot, because it took me until after the book was released to the public to get a clue about what kind of book they were trying to write. My approach to it made the book feel much more inconsistent than it really was, and so I wound up doing a lot of work that wasn't a lot of use to the author. So you want to have people looking over it who would normally want to look over it anyway. If you're worrying about military, tactical, science, details, that sort of thing, the people who are looking over it had better be pretty good at those things. If you've got just friends and family looking over it, and those friends and family aren't also military officers, tactical specialists, and scientists, you're barking up the wrong tree. What you want to do is find people, through your Friends of Friends network, if nothing else, who are good at the sorts of things you want vetted, and then be willing to let it go once you get it done. Implicit in your question is the notion that you can make the book perfect. You can't. In fact, I'm going to go way out on a limb, particularly since this is your first book, but this actually applies even if it's your 50th book. I'm going to go way out on a limb and say that it's probably not possible even to make your book close to perfect. It might not even be possible to make it a great book. In fact, I know for sure it's not possible to make it a great book because... If it was possible to make a book a great book, everybody would do it. The things that make a book a great book have as much to do with the audience receiving them and with the intangible parts of the book as they do with anything technical. I say this as a great lover and stickler for technical expertise, particularly in my historical fiction and with my violence. I like it to be accurate. I've got a thing in my head about implausible violence in books. I don't like it. It's a personal thing because I've seen a lot of violence in my life, and cartoon violence seems to me sort of like 
advertising cocaine with free candy canes or something. It's just it's just not something that works in my moral universe unless it's actually in a cartoon. But if it's in a book or in a film, I have a lot more trouble with that. But that is a completely personal issue. It has nothing to do with the merits of whatever book or film I'm looking at. And more to the point, it doesn't have a whole hell of a lot to do with how good that book is. And again, remember, I'm saying this is the guy that wrote Throwing Lead, which is all about getting technical accuracy in your firearms stuff. Who cares if your main character accidentally shoots 12 rounds out of a 10-round magazine plus one in the pipe? In the long run, that's only going to catch a really limited subset of readers. Accuracy is good, and you want it to be there. You want it to serve the plot, particularly if you're writing for an audience that's literate in the things that you're worrying about. But in terms of what's going to make the book perfect, or great, or even good, that's not where the game is. The game is in the storytelling. The point of accuracy is that it keeps your audience from getting tripped up by things that have nothing to do with the story. The story is what carries the day. It's the characters and the dilemmas and the crises and the tensions and the triumphs and the failures and the tragedies and the humor. This is what keeps and holds an audience. And it doesn't matter if there are typos in the book. At least, it doesn't matter if there are some typos in the book. You get enough in there and you'll piss your audience off. You don't want to do that. But I'll give you a fantastic example from a best-selling author who's not only a friend of mine, but is one of my best friends, Gail Carriger. In the first chapter of Solace, her first book, in the first chapter, she's talking about how it's inappropriate for someone to be carrying a parasol at night. It was terribly de rigueur to be carrying a parasol at night. She used the term that means obligatory in an attempt to express its antonym. It happens. We all make mistakes like that. But because it was a French term and it's a little obscure, it made it past all of the editors at Orbit, all of her beta readers, and went out into the book, and it's there in the audiobook and the paperback and on both sides of the pond and in the sample chapter audio play I produced and in the bloody collector's edition hardback. I read that, and I'm the kind of stickler for language. I read that, and I went, oh, I almost got thrown out of the book here, because I'm exactly the wrong audience to make that kind of error with. But I went on and read the next couple of chapters anyway, because frankly, I was stuck in the bathroom. And I loved the book. I loved the story. I got literally two, three paragraphs beyond that point, and I didn't care how many words she used wrong, how many misspellings there were. And it was a book that had some fairly poor proofreading all through it, because Orbit US was a brand new house and they were still fleshing out their copy editing team. And I didn't care. The story was fantastic. It's a great book, and the series that came after it was fantastic. It didn't matter that that thing was wrong. It didn't matter that anything that book got wrong was wrong, because the story was so good. The imperfections didn't matter. It's a very good idea to care about the quality of your work. It's a very good idea to do the best job you can. It's a very bad idea to get stuck on trying to make it perfect. If you don't have the resources right now for the beta team you want, if you don't have them available, do the best you can, release the book, and move on. And if you wind up getting a lot of fan mail saying, Oh my god, I loved your book, but for fuck's sake, man, could you fix these problems? Then you know you've done something right, because you've told the story right. And you also know that there's enough of a market for that book for it to be maybe worth going back in and giving a once or twice over when you've got more resources. In this world, you have that option. You don't want to get caught in it because you can spend your whole career revising three or four books over and over. But you have the option if it becomes important to you. But don't get so hung up on not being able to find the right dream team. On the fact that you're alone and you don't have access to the resources that J. Daniel Sawyer has. Or that someone who grew up in different circumstances or has more money to spend or whatever. Don't let those things stop you from packaging and releasing the book as best you can and moving on and writing the next one. Or, even better, writing the next one while you're packaging and releasing this one. You will grow with every book, 
And in between three and five books from now, you'll look back on the worries that you have right now, and you'll wonder why it ever seemed so desperately important to you that it got in your way. Just like when you get on a bicycle now, you wonder why it was so desperately important to you to have training wheels when you were a kid. Doesn't make any sense. The ground's not that far away, you know how to fall, and you don't fall over anyway unless a dog runs out in front of you and gets stangled in the spokes. But when you're a kid, that bit of ground, only two or three feet away from your head, because you're really short, rushing by at this speed with a balance paradigm you don't understand, that's bloody terrifying. You're going to grow out of the things that worry you now. So spend as much time on them as you need to in order to grow out of them. Don't spend more time than that. Because the opportunity cost that you incur by not writing that extra book, or not taking that extra craft course, or not reading that extra book that's on your shelf that might show you some tricks that you don't know, and by that I mean fiction book as well as just how to write book. That opportunity cost adds up over the course of a career, and it can make the difference between having 10 or 15 books done when you're finished and having a couple of hundred books done when you're finished. And that makes a difference in your longevity as a writer to the following generations. Because if you've got a hundred books done when you die, and one or two of them proves to be those immortal books, you are going to influence and affect the lives of people for generations to come, just like Charles Dickens and William Shakespeare and like Neil Gaiman probably will. And if you've only got ten books, and you only got a two percent chance of hitting that wonderful, wonderful, timeless groove, then you're going to have trouble, because a two percent chance is point two books. The numbers just aren't in your favor. The fewer books you get done, the less of a chance you've got to catch the imagination of the world. Of course, doing a lot of books doesn't guarantee that you will, and it doesn't guarantee longevity. Bulwer-Lytton was a fantastic writer, but his style was so constrained by his time that a bestseller in one era is remembered as the butt of a bad joke in another. And there will be people in the next generation who were hugely popular today who are all but forgotten. Being prolific is no guarantee of longevity, but it does stack the deck in your favor, both from a sheerly numerical point of view, and because if your attitude toward being prolific is that every book is a chance for you to get better, and to learn more, and to take risks you're also in a better position to accidentally crap out the brilliant masterpiece that lasts. That may not be what motivates you. I gotta admit, it's kind of one of the things that motivates me. I want to have the effect on another generation that the writers that I read growing up had on me. So that's one of the things I'm writing for. Everybody's reasons are different. Yours might be different. But do consider that that opportunity cost does add up over the course of a life. And you only have so many years to do your best work. I hope that helps. I know that went in a weird direction, but these things sometimes do. And I'll see you tomorrow. NaNoWriMo Every Month is written and presented by J. Daniel Sawyer and produced by Artistic Whispers Productions. Visit our website at NaNoWriMoEveryMonth.com and leave a tip in the tip jar or join the Patreon to support this podcast. NaNoWriMo Every Month is copyright 2016 by J. Daniel Sawyer and Artistic Whispers Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. 